Hey everyone, uh, welcome to another episode of Aerospace Engineering with Brian McNulty. Today we're going to be talking about how objects travel in uh, uniform circular motion and we're going to analyze the forces on those objects and how we figure out different uh, things. So without further ado, let's get started. So to begin analyzing the forces on an object traveling in uniform circular motion, we can look at this diagram to see the three different components that uh, make up the, the forces. And so, as you can see, uh, the velocity vector in blue is going to have a tangen uh, tangential component uh, only. And the acceleration is going to go towards the center of the circle. That's uh, in the radial direction, so that's a radial component. And as we learned, uh, the acceleration is always going to be in the same direction as the force. In this case, it will be called centripetal force. So that will also point inwards radially on the circle. And you can see I've drawn what's called an RTZ axis, and it's essentially a three-dimensional axis that will allow us to visualize this better. So the z-axis, as you can see, is parallel to both the R and T components, and in this diagram will be running into and out of the board. To continue moving forward, we're going to have to define a couple of things, well, a few things, uh, and those things are going to be angular velocity, angular speed, and the acceleration vector. These formulas will be helpful in determining what the acceleration is and ultimately what the force is on an object moving in circular motion. Okay, so angular velocity is going to be represented by the character lowercase omega and the angular speed, which is this blue velocity vector here, the tangential one to the circle, is going to be uh, called angular speed and the acceleration is going to be equal to v squared over r or equivalently omega squared times r. Okay, so since we know that the centripetal force is going to be the force that is responsible for changing the particle's direction along its uniform circular trajectory, we need to take a look at what kind of forces can be centripetal forces. And so we're going to do some examples and we're going to list the types of forces that those involve. So here I've drawn a list of the possible centripetal forces that are responsible for forcing an object into circular motion. After all, we know that an object in motion wants to travel in a straight line unless it's acted upon by an outside force. And in this case, a circle is not a straight line, and that means that there is a force that's making it go in a circle. So the first type that I've listed is the frictional force. And you can use static friction or the kinetic friction depending on what your application is or what your physics problem is. So in example, this would be like, you know, you could calculate how fast a car can travel in a circle before it starts to slide out of the circular path. Um, and then the normal force uh, is the second one that I've listed. That can be thought of as like when you get on the graviton machine or the gravitron machine in an amusement park where they spin you in a circle and you get stuck to the wall. What's keeping you in that circular motion is the normal force. It's the force of the wall pushi pushing against your body. Uh, gravitational force, this one should be pretty obvious. Um, since the gravity is just given rise to by massive objects in the solar system and in the universe altogether, uh, the gravitational force is going to be the force responsible for causing planets to orbit. Then we have tension. Now this might not seem uh, intuitive, but in fact the tension in a rope when you're swinging a ball in a circle, that force is going to be pointed inward just like all of these and so the tension force is going to be responsible for keeping that object tied to the string or the rope in a circular motion as you swing it above your head and the electric force is responsible for things like the electrons uh, orbiting the nucleus of an atom and uh, other such things of that nature. 
we're going to do an example now that is going to explain these concepts and I'm not going to tell you what kind of force we're going to use but uh, let's just see how far we can get here. The problem is as follows. What is the maximum speed that a 2,000 kilogram car can travel in a uniform circle with a radius of 45 meters? The coefficient of static friction between the road and the tire is going to be 0 0.9. This wouldn't be a good lesson if I didn't encourage you to try the problem yourself before I present the solution. So pause the video right now and see what you can figure out. So you notice that in the problem we have the mass of the vehicle and it looks like we have the radius of the circle that the vehicle is going to be traveling in. And I think the biggest hint here is uh, this coefficient of static friction. You know, why would I give that to you? Well, it's because the centripetal acceleration that is responsible for moving this object in a circle rather than a straight line is going to actually be equivalent to the frictional force. And the frictional force, since kinetic friction means that an object is sliding, we want to know how fast the car can go without sliding through this circle. So we're going to be using the coefficient of static friction which means that the car is going to be stuck to the circular path it is not going to be screeching around the corner we're, we're, we're going to calculate the velocity that this car can travel without skidding and so if you know what frictional force is calculated to be it is going to be uh, the coefficient of friction which I said is 0 0.9 uh, coefficient of static friction that is and then it's going to be times the normal force. And we know how to get both of those things. So what we're going to do now is uh, just plug those values in. And uh, we'll get, uh, so 0 0.9 is what I stated the, the coefficient to be, times, we're on Earth right now, so mg is going to be the normal force. And uh, the mass of the car, m, is going to be... Uh, 2,000 kilograms and then we're on earth like I said so the G is this very popular number 9.8 meters per second per second so this is what we get when we multiply the coefficient of friction times M times G and that's going to be equivalent to the static friction well so let's find the net force now on the object that's traveling in this circle. What other forces are acting on it uh, besides the frictional force? And then we can calculate the sum of the forces. Well, it turns out that in this example, uh, the net force is simply the frictional force. And so because the frictional force is the only object, or the only force that's acting on the object, now it turns out that the net force, as we learned before, um, is M times A. Well, at the beginning of the video, we said that A equals V squared over R. This is going to give us our net force, which equals the frictional force. And that is going to equal M times A which is V squared over R. So MV squared over R is going to be our formula. Now from here, it's as simple as isolating V and calculating the velocity. So here we go. So V is going to equal R times S uh, over the mass. And then we're just going to take the square root of that whole thing because V is squared over here. And once you plug in those values, you get 45 meters. Then you get the frictional force that we found earlier, which is going to be 19,600 newtons over the mass of the car, which is 2,000 kilograms. And we'll take the square root and we'll calculate that and that will give us our final velocity. So the final velocity for the car that is traveling in the circle with a radius of 45 meters and weighs 2,000 kilograms is going to be 21 meters per second, which is a reasonable answer. If you go around a turn with that kind of radius any faster, you're going to start skidding, and that's what this problem means.
Okay, so this is the same diagram that we looked at at the beginning, except now you see that it's not our Z axis that's running into and out of the page, it's our T axis and we have R and Z right here. So you're basically looking at the circle edge on as it's, it's doing this. So the force is going to be pointed in the radial direction, which is that direction. And then in this part right here, you can see that the normal force uh, and the gravitational force get taken into account because this is a horizontal circle. And so uh, the normal force and the gravitational force uh, essentially cancel out. So there's not going to be any of this going on. There's not going to be any in the Z component. There's not going to be any uh, acceleration. Essentially, that diagram that I just showed you was the same one that we showed at the beginning of the video. I simply just tilted it so that we we're, instead of looking at the circle face on, we were looking at the circle edge on. Notice how this made the t-axis or the velocity vector go away. You weren't able to see that anymore. But what you were able to see was the normal force and the gravitational force. And the normal force is used to calculate friction as we did in the previous example. Now we're going to take a look at another example that involves amusement park rides. Here we have a man in an amusement park ride which is one of those cylinders that you get in and it spins you around in a circle and then you get stuck to the wall and the floor drops beneath you and then you're stuck to the wall and there's no ground. So Essentially what's happening here is that the man is inside of this amusement park ride and he's already reached an angular velocity which is this lowercase omega here um, that is going to keep him from uh, falling in the downward direction. So I want you to take a second, pause the video and contemplate which forces are acting on the man that is inside of the ride and then think about which direction that those forces are pushing on him to maintain his circular path within the machine. Alright, so if you decided that the forces acting on the man were uh, gravity, you're correct. If you also said uh, friction, uh, that is also going to be correct. And if you said what type of centripetal force is acting on the man to keep him in a circular path, then, and you said normal, then you are also correct. So the forces at play here are the force of gravity, the force of friction, and the normal force. So here we're looking at the diagram. I've added a few things. Um, and so this is weird because the normal force is typically uh, going to be opposite of gravity, but that's not the case in this example. In fact, the force that balances out with gravity, as you can see, is static frictional force. And static frictional force is essentially keeping him from sliding down and succumbing to gravity. So those two vertical components cancel out and you're just left with the acceleration, the centripetal force the type of centripetal force that is being utilized to figure out this problem right now is the normal force. And that might sound counterintuitive, but think about this. The man inside the can might feel himself being pushed towards the out of the circle, but this whole situation is counterintuitive and that's actually not correct. What's happening actually is that the wall of the amusement ride is actually pushing in on the man who without that wall would otherwise travel in a straight line. If you're starting to notice a pattern here regarding the change of direction, acceleration, and forces, well we know that forces accelerate an object. That means that they can accelerate these objects in any direction. Acceleration is a vector. So what's happening is there must be a force pushing inward radially on the man to maintain his circular path. 
So that was an example of when the centripetal force is the normal force, or the normal force is the centripetal force. And we can use our math like we did in the previous example by setting the centripetal force equal to the normal force and solving for the velocity. So remember, centripetal force is mv squared divided by the radius, and normal force is simply just negative mass times gravity. So since my degree is in astronautical engineering, it would only be appropriate that we did an example that involves space. Now, before we begin, fun little factoid. The International Space Station, upon which our astronauts of the world conduct scientific research in space, is about 408 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. And you got to think, you know, it's got to be going pretty fast in order to continually be falling towards Earth, as that's how orbits work. Now, let's take a look at this and some applications in physics that we can use and that we've learned to solve some of these problems involving orbiting satellites. We'll start off with something relatively simple to kind of give a little background into how these orbits work. So when I said that it was constantly falling, this is what I'm going to explain right now. An object in orbit is constantly falling, but it never reaches the surface because the curve of the Earth bends away from that object and keeps it from landing on the ground. So in the 1680s or so, Isaac Newton, uh, the famous mathematician and inventor of calculus, thought up uh, an experiment or devised a thought experiment, if you will, that if he was standing right here on the planet and he threw a, or launched a cannonball, it would make a parabolic trajectory as we observe. But as he added more energy into this cannonball and shot it more uh, with higher velocity and much more force, he would eventually get uh, an orbit where the object never actually lands on the ground. And so that is how we today achieve orbit with satellites and rockets and uh, even the planets themselves orbiting the sun follow the same principle. So since I never gave you guys an equation for the force of gravity, we're going to take a quick look at that right now and then we'll go on to solving a problem. Here's our diagram again, and I've added a few new things onto it. Uh, one thing we want to focus on right now is this equation right here. This is the equation for the force of gravity. G, big G, is what's called the gravitational constant, and that's just equal to 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. And then M1 right here, that's going to be the mass of the planet uh, that we are orbiting around, and M2 is going to be the mass of the orbiting body that we are measuring the velocity of. And then we're going to have the radius of the Earth, <clears throat> but this is actually not going to be what we use completely because you notice that the radius of Earth only goes from the center of Earth to the surface of Earth. Well, if the space station is 408 kilometers above the Earth, that means that we have to take that into account and we add the Earth-Moon distance, or the Earth-Satellite distance, to the radius of the Earth to get this R that you see in the denominator of the gravity equation. Before we continue calculating the force, we need to look at some astronomical data which can be found in the back of your textbook. Here you can see that I've written the value for big G down. This is something that you're going to want to just memorize. Uh, then I got the radius of the Earth, and I, notice I also put the distance from the Earth to the Moon. That's this d sub em variable. Now, the distance from the Earth to the satellite is going to be 4.08 times 10 to the 6 meters, but that's not where the gravity is coming from. The gravity is typically thought of as emanating from the center of the Earth. And so, in order to get the orbital radius, which is our suborbit here on the third line, we have to add the radius of the Earth and the distance from the Earth to the satellite. That will result in our orbital radius that we can use to calculate the force of gravity. And then, as you can see, m sub e and m sub s are just the mass of the space station and Earth, 
and those go in the numerator of our gravity equation. Since we've already determined that the force of gravity is the centripetal force that is responsible for tethering the satellite into the orbit around Earth, we can now set the value that we just got for the force of gravity to the centripetal force equation because in this case the force of gravity and the centripetal force are the same. Let's check out what I'm talking about. So in the previous part of the video I gave you guys all the information that you needed to plug into this and essentially it's just plugging into the calculator from there. <clears throat> One important point that I would like to make though is that when you're given the radius of the Earth in an orbiting body, well sometimes that orbiting body could be so far away that it will actually make a significant difference in your answer. And so what we have to do in the case of the International Space Station that uh, resides in an orbit that is 408 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, that means that we do have to add this value for the radius and the Earth satellite distance together to get the orbital radius, which will be used in our final calculation. Now, I've just done some algebra here. Just like I mentioned, the force of gravity is going to be equal to the centripetal force in this uh, situation. And I just wrote the value for the force of gravity. You can set that equal to the centripetal acceleration, which we talked about earlier was mv squared divided by r. Rearranging for v, you get this. I just did the algebra all in one step. You feel free to work it out yourself. And then you plug in all the values for the velocity equation that you've written. And we end up getting 7,665 meters per second. That is extremely fast. And for those of us who live in the United States of America, where we don't use the metric system to describe our experiences in traffic or anything like that, uh, that's going to be close to about 17,146 miles per hour. That's super quick. I think the space station orbits the Earth 15 to 17 times every day. And uh, that makes sense though. They have to keep it going. They have to give it a large enough tangential velocity so that it never catches up with the curvature of the Earth. And that's why we have orbiting objects like all of the satellites and the International Space Station itself. In this video, we talked about three different types of centripetal force that can act on an object to influence it to remain in a uniform circular path. And those three were the frictional force, the normal force, and the gravitational force. Now this all happened in a horizontal plane or a horizontal circle. Next time we'll be discussing what happens when you apply Newton's laws to a vertical circle, such as a roller coaster going through a loop, or perhaps when somebody swings a bucket of water over their head without spilling the water all over their head. So we'll talk about that next time. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, please like and subscribe to my channel and you'll get notifications when I release new videos weekly. Thank you for viewing, and I'll see you next time on another episode of Aerospace Engineering with Brian McNulty.